Thank you. I, I assume it's no accident that Carta is the Latin for a map, and it, we're, we're obviously traveling over a lot of very uh, buried territory in this conference. I'm going to take you to somewhere even more exotic, I think, than anything we've had so far, but um, and certainly the style of my talk is going to be a bit different. Uh, about the soul, let me begin with a story from Anatole France. Um, he spins a wonderful tale about how an old blind monk, St. Mael, sets off on a mission to the Hebrides um, and lands on an island inhabited entirely by penguins. Well, they speak a rather strange language, but he assumes they must be human beings, and so he proceeds to baptize them. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, when news of this reaches heaven, it causes quite a stir. The Lord himself is embarrassed, and he summons a, a, an assembly of clerics and doctors uh, to ask, and asks them for an opinion on the delicate question of whether these birds must now be given souls. It's a matter of more than theoretical importance, it turns out. As St. Cornelius points out, the Christian state is not without serious inconveniences for a penguin. The habits of birds are in many ways contrary to the commandments of the church. Well, after lengthy discussion, the learned fathers settle on a compromise. The baptized penguins are indeed to be given, given souls, but on St. Catherine's recommendation, these souls are to be of small size. Well, the rest of the book tells the story of what happens to the small-celled citizens of Penguin Island. Their civilization turns out to be remarka remarkably like that of contemporary France. I uh, wonder why that is. <clears throat> but to my point, the penguins had to be supplied with small souls because they didn't have any sort of souls to start with. Anatole France clearly went along with René Descartes in assuming that non-human animals in general, in a state of nature, are indeed mere machines. Uh, I couldn't find a, a picture of a, of a penguin machine, but here's a, a duck machine, a Cartesian duck, without even a smidgen of a soul. Well, humans too, Descartes uh, accepted, um, are indeed machines of a kind. But what makes all the difference with humans, what transforms them into the intelligent, creative, semi-godlike creatures that they've become is, of course, that a soul has been added in on top of the mechanism. Well, today we may think this kind of dualism laughable. A hundred years after Descartes, Denis Diderot was certainly laugh laughing. He wrote, a tolerably clever man began his book with these words, man is composed of two distinct substances, the soul and the body. I nearly shut the book. Oh, ridiculous writer, you don't know what it is that you call soul, less still how they are united. But it seems that no one told Charles Darwin about this joke. Um, Fifty years later, the young Charles Darwin was writing in one of his scientific notebooks. The soul, by the consent of all, is super-added. Well, we may laugh, um, but if we do, I'm here to say that I think we ought to think again. Because if we look at all closely at human psychology, we'll find that Descartes, and for that matter, the young Darwin, were actually pretty much on target. It was Diderot, rather, who was, didn't know what he was talking about. We do know what soul is, what it is that we call soul. The soul, your soul, I'm going to talk in the second person, you'll see why. You, um, your soul is nothing less than the spirit at the core of your being. It's you, your conscious self. Um, it's the one and only subject, your private thoughts and feelings. It's the person you know yourself to be, and it's the person others treat you as being. Now, this soul of yours has obviously come into existence with your body, yet equally obviously, it's not made of bodily stuff. It lasts through the night, for example, while your body sleeps. It wanders off and leaves your body during dreams. It doesn't grow old and decrepit as your body does. And so, of course, at least this is the natural thing to hope. There's a chance that your soul should be able to outlast your body's death. Everywhere in the world, human beings have a conception of this kind. Souls, and indeed immortal souls, are part of the manifest image we humans have of what it means to be a human being. So, bully for Descartes, I'd want to say. But are you getting nervous? Um, <laughs> Here's the, ma the major, major qualification I'm going to add. This human soul has not been added by God, as Descartes would have had it. It hasn't been added by natural selection, as a modern Darwinist might want to have it. No, the truth is, the soul has been added by human culture. 
Culture, of course, working with nature, as it always does, but not bounded by the competence of genes. The soul is your culture's view of who you are. To put it bluntly, you come to have a soul in rather the same way as you may come to have a passport. The soul is a kind of culturally sanctioned, internalised identity document. It tells you your vital statistics, your sex, your birthday, your parentage, who you're married to and so on, where you've been and when you went there and so on, this history of your life. And most important, it tells you what your rights are. You probably can't read that there. Her Britannic Majesty, Secretary of State, requests and requires in the name of Her Majesty all those whom it may concern to allow the bearer to pass freely. So you'll appreciate that this soul isn't just any kind of, uh, of identity paper. Um, here's a small soul, if you ever was one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, can, you probably can't read that. This number, it reads, has been established for uh, Nicholas Humphrey. A number, is that all? Um, uh, no, my soul, your soul, is much more than a number. It's a document that makes you feel quite special and important. Just look at that first page. When I first had my passport, I'd spent ages admiring it. What a fine fellow am I. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't push this analogy too far, but here's the punchline. The human soul, your passport to personhood, also has a highly significant first page. And this is where nature, biological evolution, comes in. For behind the soul, and preceding it in evolutionary history, is nothing less than the conscious self. The self founded on the experience of sensations with their magical, phenomenal qualities. This soul of yours blinks into life every morning when you re-emerge from sleep and rediscover what it's like to be the living you. When you see the dawn, when you hear the birds singing, when you feel the cold sheets, when you smell the coffee. When sensations refill the lake of your being. Here you are living, as I put it, in the thick moment of consciousness. Here you are in this strangely private world, experiencing sensations that are yours alone. Here you are, and here we all are, sharing in that mysterious, unshared world of self. Here you are, a kind of focal singularity within the universe, but well aware and thankfully aware that you're not the only one. Now, are these conceptions of the self unique to human beings? I'd say we can fairly assume that the feeling of existence, the sense of interiority, of privacy, individuality that comes with consciousness is something many non-human animals feel as well. The groundwork for the soul was done by natural long selection long before humans came on the scene. But it's only we humans who, egged on by culture, have built this up into the notion of a fully-fledged, spiritually-driven human being. Now, much of the self-glorification that goes into this is, of course, delusory. It's wishful thinking. But could it be useful wishful thinking? What could be the payoff of thinking ourselves, of ourselves in this grand way? Diderot scoffed at any suggestion that the soul could be a, a beneficial add-on. Here's what he wrote. If the union of a soul to a machine is impossible, let someone prove it to me. If it is possible, let someone tell me what would be the effects of this union. And he went on to ask, what difference between a sentient living pocket watch and a watch of gold or iron or, or silver or copper? If a soul were joined to the latter, what would it produce therein? Well, the answer Descartes clearly was going for was none, no difference. The soul would have no practical effect on the watch. It simply wouldn't show. But what a bad analogy. Diderot takes a machine with just one dimension of expression, with no scope whatever for love or tenderness or creativity, and then he mocks it for not showing soulful behaviour. Yes, if you're a watch and all you're about is clocking the time, then indeed adding a soul it won't make any difference. You won't notice it. But if you're a human being and you add a soul, if you're a human in a human community, and if all the other other humans around you have souls too. If what you're about together is friendship and cooperation and invention and speculation, why, then it's a very different story. We humans have indeed discovered that we are a society of souls, and the idea is extraordinarily potent psychologically, ethically, and politically. 
And I dare say that from the moment it took off among our ancestors, it must have been highly adaptive. I mean, adaptive in the conventional sense, uh, in, in, in ensuring its own continuation. It transformed human relationships. It encouraged new levels of mutual respect, and it must have greatly increased the value each person put on his own on the, and on, on, on others' lives. As the theologian Keith Ward has put it, the whole point of talking of the soul is to remind ourselves constantly that we transcend all the conditions of our material existence. We transcend them precisely in being indefinable, always more than can be seen or described, subjects of experience and action, unique and irreplaceable. So here's why I'm driving. For members of the human species to live in a world where people have this kind of opinion of themselves is to live in what we can call the soul niche. And I mean niche now in the conventional ecological use of that term. It's an environment to which a species has become adapted and where it is designed to flourish. Trout live in rivers. Gorillas live in forests. Bedbugs live in beds. Humans live in soul land. Soul land is a territory of the spirit. It's a place where the magical interiority of human minds makes itself felt on every side. It's a place where we naturally assume that every other human lives as we do in the, in the extended present of phenomenal consciousness, where we recognize and celebrate the awesome possibilities of individual private joy and suffering. It's a place where the fate of one's own and other people's souls is a constant talking point, where souls are the subject of gossip, of tender concern, of mean speculation, of manipulation by prayer and by spells. It's a place where the claims of the spirit begin to rank just as highly as the claims of the flesh. Or I could go on in that vein, but I don't need to. You live there. You know. And the consequence of this was, well, the consequence is that human beings are destined to dwell on those eternal questions which Fred mentioned at the very beginning of this conference. Where have we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And it's been in asking and answering those questions that our species, as a biological entity, has indeed raised itself nearly to the level of the gods. Well, what's the point of that? Do humans really need to ascend to the level of the gods? Um, I've been told, Dan Dennis told me, that this hypothesis, that consciousness has evolved just so as to give, this, give us this inflated idea of ourselves, is functionally extravagant. It makes our consciousness to be a solution to a non-problem. I don't think so. You might as well object that birds don't need to fly. Terrestrial animals were doing just fine before any of them thought of taking to the sky. Flight was a solution to a non-problem, you might say. Yet wings and flight opened up a new world for birds to exploit. And looking at the history of human beings over the last 100,000 years, looking at that history, I think we conclude that angel wings did much the same for us. Thank you. <laughs>